Welcome to the Lord's Banquet Part 2. Uh, in this part we're going to take a look at the introductions and compare the introductions between Isaiah 25 and Luke chapter 14. Now, I've done hundreds of these studies and I've already looked at the prophecy and the fulfillment in these stories and matched them with the introductions and summaries. When you're using keywords to look at the fulfillment of a prophecy, at times you'll get a feeling right away on what story will actually fit. And other times you'll have to check two or three stories, you know, the introductions and the summations to see if they're actually a good fit. Sometimes 10 or 12. Other times you can't find a recorded fulfillment. That just means God feels the world is not ready for the answer, or we may not understand it because certain events have not yet taken place. Now, some people may be saying to themselves, the parable about a king and a banquet for a son is not a, <coughs> it's not a fulfillment of a prophecy. It is only a parable. Well, Jesus told parables to get people to do some individual searching. God can teach any way he wants. What we need to do is consider the information given and see how it relates to the world we see today. So far, we've uncovered two descriptions. When we put them together, give us a clear view of the spiritual meaning. In the parable, Luke wrote, uh, Men had better things to do than honor a king and a prince with their presence. They would rather work and take care of business then attend a banquet. That alone conjures up image of people in this world who honor money above all things, like selling out your country for a number of payments. That's happening today both on the national and world levels. Uh, then we have one little line Isaiah added. There, there he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth, he will swallow up death forever. Well, one of the things that this story really covers and, and really presents to us is the use of contrast, which is difficult for most people to see and understand. Luke focused on more or less the negative aspects. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Isaiah added some of the positive aspects. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day the people will proclaim this is our God. We trust in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Now we know that <clears throat> this is basically a prophecy of the feast, the banquet in heaven after Jesus' return. But why are we matching it up with a parable about a banquet? Well, it's the lessons that we're looking for. Right now, we're still in the learning process. Like, for instance, it's not unusual to pause and compare what we've read and learned in the Bible to what is happening in this world. Now, just a quick review of the news this week. I happened to watch a video from the black conservative perspective that showed a video filmed in Texas. In this video filmed in Texas, there was a guy that was trying to excite the immigrants that just passed over the border. We know that over this weekend in, in uh, May of 2023, there's tens of thousands of, of immigrants crossing the border by the hour. Now they're all gathering in towns wondering what to do. I mean... Obviously, they've been promised all of this free stuff. Well, they don't have, you know, Democrats invited them in, but Democrats didn't do anything to get them all this free stuff they promised them. <coughs> so.
So what they did is they planted a couple of people in there to rally up the immigrants. Well, basically this guy was just telling the immigrants that, you know, this is your land now. It's no longer, you know, basically what he's doing is he's promising the immigrants that just came into this country uh, reparations. That they can go out and take whatever they want, they deserve it, blah, 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 the whole bit. And if you noticed in the video, the guy speaks rather good English. Is this a plant from the government or from the world economic forum? You know, the, who's behind this and who's planting these people in there to start riling the immigrants up to go out and take whatever they want? Hey, but this is guy filming, you know, just documenting what's going on in El Paso, Texas. Yeah. Watch how these these illegals are talking to him. Check it out. You can go to work. Don't take me. Don't take me. Don't take me. Don't touch my camera. Don't touch my phone. Don't fucking take me, motherfucker. You're in America. It's a free country. Okay, so what? Well, you don't know who you are. Go home. Okay, no, no. I don't go home. Go home. You, you go home. Well, let's take my home. Fuck you, motherfuckers. We're showing people what's going on in El Paso. Motherfucking fat ass. Go fucking mad at diet, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac, boy. Vete a comprarte una pinche Big Mac, gordito. So this is what you get when you get illegal entry into this country, guys. This is what you get. You get people that disrespect this country, that don't love this country, and don't love the freedoms. And this is what Joe Biden is bringing in. Those people like young guys. Now, another video I saw uh, showed a communist political meeting in Minnesota to where they disagreed on one point. You know, a communist meeting disagree on one point. Uh, they <laughs> that disagreement instantly broke out into a fight, a shouting match. It it, it basically showed how a communist are always that way. If there's one point that someone doesn't agree on, their philosophy is to eliminate that opposing point of view. There is no other point of view other than themselves. <laughs> AKA the Socialist Party. And a fight erupt, okay? Uh, all hell broke loose. Take a look. Here in Minnesota's DFL party says he is going to call an emergency meeting on their state executive committee to address the issues on Ward 10's convention yesterday. <laughs> That is video from the neighborhood news outlet Wedge Live. It shows the conflict at the Ward 10 DFL endorsing convention in Minneapolis yesterday. Supporters of current city council member Aya Shuktai and challenger Nasri Warsami clash as they vie for the DFL endorsement. Warsami supporters eventually stormed the stage, stopping the meeting. Officers were called out, but say the fighting was over by that time. No arrests were made. One woman was treated for an injury. In other words, the Lord is moving his hand and showing us that, uh, number one, the reparations the Democrats have been promising to the blacks that voted for them, well, they're not going to do any real reparations. They never planned on doing it. It was just a campaign promise. But sorry, uh, black people, we're giving your reparations to our new, you know, guests in this country. Uh, so you'll just have to sit back and, and, and wait a little bit. Don't forget to vote for us again, because after the next election, we're going to fulfill that promise. Okay, another video from uh, Serpenza showed women executed in China because they dated too many men. Not even having sexual relations with them, just dating them. And he also pointed out that in China what China does to homosexuals. I mean, if we look at what's happening in the United States today, 
this big, I'm going to call it the sexual revolution, is all behind giving this country over to control of communist China. Well, little do they know that if you check your history with communists, they always eliminate the parties that got them into power first. Uh, We generally refer to that as genocide. And uh, if you look at that video by uh, Serpenza, he's going to show that the communists have no intention of fulfilling the sexual fantasies of the sexual revolution group that's trying to overthrow the United States now. Well, at the exact same time over in China, this pretty young girl was being executed for having too many boyfriends. She hadn't been cheating or sleeping around, but because she had too many boyfriends one after the other, she was charged with female hooliganism, loaded onto a truck, taken out into a field, and shot by the Chinese government with an AK-47. We will get into the story of Diman Xia. Combat and regulate sexuality. The Chinese government implemented a broad and sweeping criminal penalty, the offense of hooliganism, or Yu Mengzui. This like many Chinese laws, was intentionally very vague and open-ended and could result in arbitrary arrests and punishments, including execution, based solely on how the local government enforcers were feeling that day. Countless people were arrested and punished for hooliganism during the period this law was heavily enforced. That's the period between 1979 and 1996. Yes, the same year as people were dancing the Macarena and playing Tomb Raider, Chinese people were still being arrested and punished for hooliganism. Now, some people might ask why I didn't use an actual event like the banquet Matthew or Zacchaeus threw for Jesus. Uh, Like I said, I went through and checked the introductions and summaries, and Luke had the introduction and the summaries that best lined up and and, and matched up and and came through with a true description of here's the prophecy and here is the fulfillment based on the introduction and the summaries. Introduce the main subject and summarize the main subject and we want to make sure that we keep all of this with in context. So if you want to check those out on your own, uh, the other banquets and the gospels, go ahead, check them out and maybe you'll find some amazing details and share them in the comments. But, you know, it is a good idea to compare the other stories that are so closely related to this banquet and ask yourself why. Now we're looking for patterns in the Bible, right? So we got to ask ourselves, why are there so many stories about banquets? So, wouldn't it make sense to take a look at them and look for patterns in the Bible? And we're going to jump right into the lesson. Uh, So, what does this study take on our part? Isaiah tells us God only requires a little bit of trust from us. In that day, the people will proclaim, This is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Remaining on milk and refusing solid food with seeds to spread is doubting God and his ability. It's not our work that changes people. It's God's work. All we need to do is become a living example and deliver messages God designed. One more detail we need to review is Isaiah's introduction in chapter 25. So we're going to read chapter Isaiah chapter 25 verses 1 through 5. The introduction is just the first few lines in a chapter. Oh God, I will honor and praise your name, for you are my God. You do such wonderful things. You planned them long ago. And now you have accomplished them. You turn mighty cities into heaps of ruin. Cities with strong walls are turned to rubble. 
beautiful palaces and distant lands disappear and will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong nations will declare your glory. Ruthless nations will fear you. But you are a tower of refuge to the poor, O Lord, a tower of refuge to the needy in distress. You are a refuge from the storm and a shelter from the heat. For the oppressive acts of the ruthless people are like a storm beating against a wall, or like the relentless heat of the desert. But your silence, the roar of a foreign nations, as the shade of a cloud cools relentless heat, so the boastful songs of ruthless people are stilled. Now Isaiah opened this chapter like no other chapter in his book. This introduction mirrors many of David's prayers and psalms. It may seem strange to find an introduction explaining important aspects of prayer in a chapter containing a prophecy about the banquet God is preparing in heaven. Now, how do you plan on making it to that banquet? What steps are you going to take? We know Jesus is the bread of life. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. Now that's John chapter 6. Well, it goes a lot deeper than Jesus being just the bread of life. People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Find that in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus meant more than physical bread. He meant much more than a casual knowledge of Jesus and a prayer for the salvation he offers. We have to know his word. We have to commit ourselves to preparing our heart, mind, and soul to be a servant. Now notice how problems are solved in ways you never imagined. Notice how God sends you to people you never expected. God reaches out to more people in more ways than anyone can imagine. It is like the generous variety of food he prepares for his banquet. God not only loves diversity, he also loves, cares for, and reaches out to all the individuals as we see in the introduction in Luke 14. So, Luke 14, verses 1 through 6. One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of the leader of the Pharisees, and the people were watching him closely. There was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in religious law, Is it permitted to heal people on the Sabbath day or not. When they refused to answer, Jesus touched the sick and healed him and sent him away. Then he turned to them and said, Which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? If your sons or your cow falls into a pit, don't you rush to get them out? Again, they could not answer. Now this is one thing we really need to, to focus on and study the Bible for. So we're in a position that when people start asking us questions, uh, we're going to give them answers or, or, or we're going to be able to ask a question and they're not going to give an answer. But we see it every day. Uh, we see it in the woke. You can ask anybody in any level of the woke generation a question and they're just programmed not to answer. Why? Because they're told not to answer or because their brains are not wired to answer the simplest questions. Now there's two questions that instantly come to mind when we read this. What does the introduction to prayer in Isaiah have to do with Jesus eating dinner with a Pharisee? Uh, the other question is, what dinner is Luke referring to? 
Luke's simplicity brings to mind a number of dinners recorded in the Gospels. One day Jesus met Matthew and told him, follow me. Matthew got up and not only followed Jesus, he was so excited he invited Jesus to dinner and invited all his friends. Now being a tax collector, the only people who associate with Matthew were what? Other tax collectors. So this illustrates the point that we all have our own individual ministries and we're able to reach people that other people aren't. I, I, I know some people that are just way out, but they're really good Christians and patriots and they associate with people that I would never find myself associating with because I haven't been put in that position, but God has them in that position to reach out to that particular class. And God bless them because they are some of the most dedicated, fearless workers for God I have ever met. Okay, eating with tax collectors was a mark on the negative side as far as the religious leaders were concerned. You know, they were instantly judged. The Pharisees and the priests didn't know the tax collectors, <coughs> but judged them all all. Nonetheless, uh, near the end of his ministry, Jesus had dinner with Simon, uh, a man Jesus cured of leprosy. During that dinner, Mary came in to anoint Jesus for his burial and to wash his feet. Now, some people at that dinner were not happy with a sinner like Mary being around while they were eating. At another dinner, four men lowered their paralyzed friend through the roof of the building, placing him in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. You see the way Jesus used two different symbols to make a point, forgiving sins? and healing a person. Uh, that's just little details that we got to learn to look at and see. And once again, we have the Pharisees, you know, condemning people right away. Uh, so what do those dinners have in common? Religious leaders opposing Jesus were present. Now, here's a really important point you need to learn before you can understand Isaiah or any of the other books in the Bible. Isaiah is a lesson book unlike any other book in the Bible. <clears throat> Isaiah communicated with God in so many different ways. Isaiah teaches us how God communicates with us. God spoke to Isaiah. God also gave Isaiah visions. God also communicated in dreams. Isaiah also shows us how to see common threads in the Bible. Isaiah also teaches us how God's Spirit leads us to those common threads. Now here we see common threads in the banquets, or feasts, or dinners, whatever you want to call them, that Jesus attended. Jesus healed people at each of those dinners physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Now those were points the religious leaders couldn't see. Now ask yourself why. The question is plainer than you think. Those religious leaders did not communicate with God. What would God's Spirit tell them about Jesus if they knew how to listen? How much do people miss today if they don't know how to communicate with God? If they don't know how to listen to His voice? Those religious leaders forgot how to pray. Now, compare yourself to them. We all make the same mistakes. 
We all think we're talking with God. We all think we're listening to God, but are we really listening? God's Spirit can be brutally honest. People know that. That's why people tend to avoid that aspect of prayer. It's called confession. And realistically, when we look out at the woke community today, it doesn't matter what faction you're looking at because there's all these different factions. Uh, They all have one thing in common. Uh, They all hate Christians because Christians Christians remind them of confession. They, the last thing on earth they want to do is confess their sins or say that they were wrong. And that's why they want to eliminate every Christian on earth. Now let's look at the mistakes those religious leaders, leaders made to see if we can learn a few lessons about ourselves. Put yourself in their place. Be honest about what those religious leaders thought and how they justified the things they did. Now let's take the sacrificial system as an example. Now their system consisted of inspecting lambs and rejecting them, uh, paying a small price to take the animal off the hands of the sinner, then charging a high price for an animal they deemed was perfect. Of course the lamb they purchased was sent back to the courtyard and put in a pen to be sold to the next unsuspecting soul. And the thing about it is everybody knew this was going on. Everybody saw it going on but they didn't know what to do about it. Aren't we in the same position today with you know uh, Democrats in two years spent 22 trillion dollars and we know they're stealing tax money and we don't know what to do with it. Uh, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin and a few other senators compiled bank records and all this other stuff about uh, Hunter Biden and Joe Biden enough to to fill up uh, dump trucks full of paperwork evidence of what was happening and we see all this evidence and we're asking how come nothing's being done about it well what are we doing are we waiting on God to do something about it well I hope we are I think that's what everybody's doing so how much money did God get from, uh, you know, this this scheme that the uh, priest had worked out? How much of that money was used to alleviate pain, suffering of the poor people, orphans, and widows? Uh, that was the second sin those religious leaders neglected to confess. They justified their neglect by convincing themselves widows, orphans and poor people were suffering vengeance from God based on their past sins. Those religious leaders convince themselves they serve God by inflicting more pain and suffering on widows, orphans, and poor people, as well as the lame, blind, and sick people. Religious leaders created their own little world where they lived their lives of luxury with additional privileges while people they were supposed to serve suffered under heavy burdens. Uh, What's the difference between those religious people and the elected officials we have today that are doing the same thing? Another piece of the plan was convincing themselves part of their role in serving God was to go to the extremes of showing how God blessed them. (laughs) Those religious leaders led a life of masquerading like priests. Well, no one with as much authority and responsibility was further from God than themselves. Well, that was one example showing how people drift away from God. The distance is small at first. Change rule here, another there. Finally, they forget to confess their sins altogether. Pride is a dangerous cliff with a big drop. Now take this example and compare it to the kings in Jerusalem Isaiah had to deal with. Because we're, we're, the more you put these scenes into the characters involved in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the better off you're going to be able to see it in real life. Now, uh, didn't most of those kings forget how to pray? I mean, just think of the stories in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, you know, he had to cross, you know, there were wars, 
all over the place. People were just murdered just for the sake of murdering people. I mean, it took a lot of faith for Isaiah to, to travel from king to king to king to deliver a message from God. And then he had to put his life in his hands. Actually, he put his life in God's hands to walk up to a king and give him a message from God. And then turn around and walk out. Now, if you remember those stories in Isaiah, uh, the Bible constantly compared those kings to David for a reason. Some of those kings were like David, and other kings were not like David at all. Now, why did the Bible keep on repeating that pattern? To remind us of the fact David spoke to God. When David didn't want to listen, God sent a prophet. Simple story. David listened to the prophets, then confessed his sins. David was a man after God's own heart. You see, we just saw another pattern in the Bible that's easily explained. So David was a symbol of how to communicate with God. So what do we do now with these examples from the Bible? We're seeing how Isaiah leads us to text with the same theme. As we see how lessons build and expand, we learn how to understand context and how God wrote the Bible. We also see how God's Spirit brings parallel chapters together for us to see how spiritual lessons are taught using a series of examples. See, when we're dealing with parallel chapters, the lessons have to expand. Otherwise, we're not, we're not, we're not really studying. It's easy to see patterns. It's easy for me to see patterns because of my training and experience in engineering. <coughs> One of the things I did in engineering uh, was we had computers, and when I was uh, actually drafting on a computer, I would it suddenly dawned on me. You know, this is the third time I used this series of commands. Uh, you know, there's eight steps I got to do. And, and I'm doing it 8, 10, 12 times a day. Well, on um, the computer system that we had, which was a Linux system far more advanced than any of the computer systems they use today, uh, we had macro keys. <clears throat> and some people know about macros. And a macro, within the program, you can write a small program that will execute a series of, of steps. Well, I wrote short macros using the entire alphabet on a computer, uh, alternate the entire alphabet on a computer, control the entire alphabet. I wrote, how many is that? About a hundred shortcut patterns. So my mind is always focused on looking for patterns and finding an easier way of being more efficient. So that's a little bit of my background on what qualifies me to be a teacher. Also, Taught in the uh, Army Reserves. Uh, I was in the Reserves, served under my dad and alongside my brother. And there was a thing about, you know, the people, my dad was in charge of the company and the people really respected my dad. And the uh, sergeants with hundreds of years of experience were going to make me the best instructor the Army ever knew, even if it was going to kill me. So. I can see in, 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 in my life, God put me on a path to prepare me for things like this. So, to summarize the introductions, what does rebuilding walls and cities have to do with Jesus healing a man at a banquet? We're just comparing the introductions to Isaiah 25 and Luke 14 right now. Well, Isaiah wrote about rebuilding walls and cities. Luke, and we can actually look at the other gospel writers, they wrote about Jesus rebuilding lives. You see how the symbols, when we put these stories together, the symbols in the Bible are always explained within the stories. Well, of course, I know you all saw that. 
If nothing else, Jesus told parables to get people to think. This theme dwells on building a future that looks forward to life on in heaven, which begins with a vision of what heaven is like.